So now I'm glad to introduce to you Julia Fallon, who is a strategic policy advisor at Europeana, and she will talk about exploring impact in the cultural heritage sector. Welcome, Julia. Thank you. Uh, um, yeah, sure, hold on. Just check that works. Hey, hello. All these lights are quite bright. Um, so, hi, I'm going to speak in English, in case you haven't guessed. Um, I also realised that I'm the last presentation before um, the coffee break, so um, I hope that I give you some interesting food for thought, um, and I'll try to make this an enjoyable next um, half hour or so. Uh, okay, so... Um, where, what are you doing? <laughs> uh, <laughs> you're not sure? Okay. <laughs> Oh, okay. Um, there you go. Okay, so before I um, move on, um, impact's been used um, quite a lot. Um, today I've heard the word being used in a number of presentations. Um, but I want to talk to you about um, what I mean when I talk about impact. Because at Europeana, we've been working on um, uh, impact and understanding impact for um, a few years now. And we've realized that actually what we need to do is start um, defining some of the terms we use so that we have a common understanding of it. So when I talk about impact, I'm specifically talking about this. The changes that occur for our stakeholders, so the people we work for and with, or society, as a result of um, certain actions or um, activities that we do. So, so the work that we do. What really changes for the people um, that use our digital cultural heritage resources. Um, and we think that if we understand our impact, these changes that we achieve through our work, we can use that as business intelligence. And we can use it in a number of different ways. Um, we can just use it to simply understand our work a little bit better. But we can also use it to make better decisions um, and to bring about more changes, more positive changes in the work that we do. And I've got some examples of that um, in... Um, have I just... I'm hearing a bit of feedback in my um, voice. Um, so I've got some examples of that from the research that I'm going to show you. Um, we can also use um, impact to improve um, accountability to funders and policymakers. There's an increasing drive. Um, I think, um, Ole, I didn't really understand, I'm afraid I don't speak Swedish, your presentation, but I think you've talked a little bit about um, how you include the, the outcomes of cultural heritage in policymaking. Um, to improve and increase support for the digitization of cultural heritage. And you can use impact work, being able to demonstrate and articulate the changes that occur from the work that you do to increase the support that you actually receive from policymakers. And you can also use it to change the way you communicate in a, in a different way. And we're, we're also working on that at Europeana. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about why um, impact is interesting to Europeana. Um, I hope that you're all um, a little bit familiar with Europeana and what we do. I'm going to talk about what we do and you're going to learn a little bit along the way if you're not, so please bear with me. Um, but we have a goal. We want to transform the world with culture. We've been um, existing now uh, for 10 years and we've been working with cultural heritage organisations across Europe to um, support the digitisation process, um, to support them sharing and making their available their, their cultural heritage objects online using standardised frameworks, data models, rights statements. And we're changing now to moving towards helping um, surface really good collections, high quality items, and um, encouraging the reuse of that digital um, cultural heritage. And we think that actually um, we've been pretty successful, we're pretty pleased with where we've got to, but we think that we need to start changing a bit of the conversation because it's great that we've got to 53 million objects. It's great that we work with 3,500 cultural heritage institutions, it really is. But some of the, sometimes these numbers get so big, they become a little bit meaningless. And what we want to be able to do is talk about what's really changed as a consequence, what happens now that didn't happen 10 years ago, when you couldn't access all this fantastic digital cultural heritage? And how do we actually connect these changes with some of the strategic goals that are being put in place at the European level and also um, the global level? You've heard the, SDR, the Sustainable Development Goals be mentioned a few times. 
And so we want to use um, our work trying to better understand impact to help articulate what happens, um, what changes come about from working with Europeana, what changes come about from just digitizing cultural heritage, and how you can use that, that understanding to then uh, articulate how you contribute to these other goals, whether that's within your um, local area, within Sweden itself, within Europe, or on a global stage. Um, so we start really with the premise that we think that digitizing cultural heritage is transformative. It has the power to transform society. And that's really the basis on which we undertook a lot of research into the impact of our activities. Um, and I'm wondering, sorry, the light is really bright here, so I'm trying to see some, um, some faces. I'm wondering um, if everybody else in the room agrees with me. Um, so could you put your hand up if you think that digitizing cultural heritage really does have the power to deliver a change to society? Okay, good. Um, and can you put your hand up if you have any evidence to show that? Okay, so if you didn't look around to see who'd put their hand up, I'd say probably about 60, 70% of you did, but nobody, unless I'm very much mistaken, put your hands up to say you have any evidence. Um, it's because it's really quite difficult, and that's one of the problems we're trying to address with the work we're doing on impact. Um, so, um, I'm going to give you some examples of what, um, what research we've done um, and what when we're talking about um, the impact we're having, what that looks like. And then I'll talk to you a little bit about how we actually came about doing that research. And also how you can do it as well, if you're interested. Um, and it starts really with understanding that we want to transform the world with culture, but of course that's a very difficult thing to prove. So we have to then break down um, our work into different markets. And if you actually have read our business plans for the last two years, you'll see that they're broken down by, by markets, but also, um, that for each market, we include um, a statement of the impact we intend or hope to have for that market. Um, if you haven't paid attention to that, go back and have a look and you'll see that it's there. We've also um, considered that in the, key, uh, the, key, the KPIs that we add um, to each market, so that we're really trying to think about not only the traditional outputs, such as number of objects digitized and NPS scores and what have you, but we're also trying to understand the positive, more social impact-driven uh, benefits that we can have. And so for those of you who aren't particularly um, familiar with uh, the, the markets that we um, target through our work at Europeana, we obviously work with cultural heritage institutions, um, our bread and butter. We um, work for European citizens. We tend not to work directly with them and for them, but we do just by virtue of having um, a website that you can search and APIs. We we do um, work for them, but we also target specifically reuse of digital cultural heritage in the research, education, and creative industries markets. Um, so we did some research uh, last year into cultural heritage institutions. Um, and I wonder if you can just help me understand who exactly is in the room. Could you put your hand up if you are from a cultural heritage institution? Okay, great, loads of you. Um, could you put your hand up if you uh, are a data provider to Europeana? Just a few, okay, so you're one of the 66 Swedish institutions who provide 3.2 million objects to Europeana from Sweden. Um, to the gentleman who's asked me last night, you can find this information um, on our website. Um, broken down by country, what your contribution is, etc. cetera. Um, and can you put your hand up if you're a member of our network? Much fewer. Okay, apparently there are only 39 people registered from Sweden. Um, I'd also like to just tell you there are two Swedish representatives um, on the governing, uh, on the Members Council of the European Network Association. Um, and of course, Rolf um, was uh, one of the founding uh, councillors when we set up the Network Association to integrate um, members of the network into the governance of everything that Europeana does. Um, so you've actually had quite a lot of interactions with us. Um, but um, what I um, want to go through now is, uh, okay, this is a bit of a, it's, it's a bit of a tricky thing to say. I'm going to tell you some things that we didn't know and um, what we actually do now now. So for years, we've been thinking that we are advocates of open data. And we hope through all the work that we do, um, providing frameworks and standards, um, workshops and research and papers and blogs and a community that we um, raise awareness of the value of opening up collections 
and that we actually have um, an influence on the number of open collections available. Now, obviously, we're not the only factor in decision making, but we think that we do. But we've never, never actually asked anyone. So we think we do, but we never asked anyone until last year. And we did some research. We took a sample of um, the institutions that we work with, and um, we actually found that before working with Europeana, um, organizations um, scored the value of open data um, quite low, but only about 24% of organizations said that it was important to them. After working with Europeana, um, we were really pleased to see that people are reporting, about 50% of people were reporting that um, there was an increase in how open data and the importance of opening data was perceived within their institutions. And so this only tells us one side of the story. It doesn't tell us who else was a factor, but this tells us something we really didn't know before. Um, and one of the things that I'd love you to take away from this is that uh, undertaking research into your impact and what changes can give you so much interesting insight into how people perceive what you're doing. And you really can use that um, to drive product development and service development in your organization. And it, it helps test a lot of assumptions. Because another thing we didn't know is um, we didn't know if people really built partnerships from being part of the network. So all of you who said you are part of the network, we probably sold you being part of the network, saying you can contribute to the governance, you can meet other organizations, you can build partnerships and collaborations, which will help you share knowledge, um, increase funding, access more funding possibilities. But we've never asked, because it's actually quite difficult to track. Um, until last year when we thought, well, let's just ask people, have you, have you had more access to collaborations? Have you built more partnerships? And we found that actually 81% of people who responded did, which was a surprise. Um, I have to say the 81% sounds quite good, but because we had never actually tracked the data, we never put in place um, any expectations. Um, so it sounds quite good, but it's not good if we actually we expected 100% of everybody in the network to um, to, to develop new collaborations and partnerships. Um, and finally, we also um, uh, advocate that being part of the network and contributing to Europeana will help you individually, but also your organization to build new skills and knowledge. You'll come to workshops, you'll come to events, you'll run them yourselves, you'll connect with new people. Um, but we again, you're getting the theme now, we didn't never actually asked anyone because these are quite difficult questions um, to ask. Um, we found that 80, more than 80% of people said that they actually did see an increase in the number of skills um, and knowledge with, from within their organization. And every time we ask these questions, um, we just use a straight Likert scale, um, uh, uh, 1 to 10, to ask people to, to um, uh, evaluate their response. We also ask them a very open question about, could you give us an example of, of when that actually occurred from you? So all the quotes you can read, um, are people's actual um, responses. So it's sort of, um, uh, some of them are quite enlightening, some of them are quite long, um, and they seem quite obvious. Um, but this, for us, this was really, really interesting. Um, and I think we're gonna keep asking these questions. Um, moving on, we also asked individuals, people who just use Europeana um, collection site, they come across us through Facebook or Twitter or their newsletter subscribers. Um, so what we wanted to know is we wanted to know if, if they actually increase their knowledge and understanding of whatever it was they're looking for, maybe a photography technique or a particular genre or a painting. Um, and we don't ask that kind of question. Again, we found that 66% of people said they did. Again, it's useful, but not because we, we didn't set a target for this or an expectation. So it sounds quite good. Um, but I wonder if we could do more. I wonder if we could expect more. Um, we, um, as I said earlier, we're working specifically with um, digital humanities researchers to try to increase the amount of um, usage of um, digital cultural heritage in uh, research. Um, so we reached out to them specifically and asked how using Europeana helped them refine um, their expertise and their research. And we found that 41% said that it did. Um, like weekend, we were quite pleased. But overall, I think the, the general thing is we were quite pleased with what we found from this research, but we hadn't set any standards. Um, 
we found that um, the researchers and academics had some lovely things to say about Europeana, but it doesn't tell us how we can make more and how we can um, raise more awareness across the Digital Humanities Network um, to make um, the resources more widely used. Um, and going back to that question of open and importance, we threw a question to the individuals um, about um, how important they thought open data was, because we asked the institutions and we thought that's great. Um, and we actually found that people on the street, citizens, also see that there's um, an increase in their value of open data since using Europeana, which is good because this was a little bit outside of um, our area of kind of responsibility. We, we want to supply digital culture heritage openly available in high quality for people to use, um, but we didn't really have an expectation that we'd also be able to influence their understanding of what was important, whether it's high quality data, um, high quality images, um, or in this case, open data. So that was quite a surprise. Um, we don't know whether we're accountable or how much of that we're accountable for, because again, in the same way for cultural heritage institutions, there's lots of other organizations and initiatives like this conference, which also contribute to um, influencing um, your organization's opinions and policies. Um, but this information gave us some really interesting insights. We also, two years ago, we, um, we didn't, we've not always just looked at Europe as a whole. So two years ago, we did um, uh, some impact research into our collection days that we run as part of um, a campaign to surface personal stories from World War I. Um, it's reported in a case study called Workers Underground. There's a, a video uh, that you can watch um, with some interviews with people sharing digital objects. Um, and one of the um, important um, facts we got from that was that people who participated expected to learn quite a lot from participating. But when we asked them how much they actually learned, it wasn't really as much as they expected. And that told us, well, there's a real barrier here. And so we tried to interrogate where, do, where are the barriers to them learning? And one of them was language. So a lot of the... Um, a lot of the objects that had been presented and stories that had been shared were in languages that these people didn't speak or have access to. And we were not in the position at that time to then translate or transcribe the, the works. Um, so we've looked at how can we then support transcribing and translating um, the objects that have been surfaced through these collection days. Um, and this data has then made us more convinced that we should do more. Um, to support that type of activity, because we want people to learn from the actions that we do. We want people who come to collection days and share their objects to feel part of culture. We want them to feel valued, but we also want them to learn from their participation about themselves, but also about other people. If they can't do that because of language, that's a shame. That's a real bad thing. Um, so that was a really interesting one for us. Um, and this year, we're actually um, undertaking five um, impact assessments across a number of different projects. One of them is um, across our migration campaign, which is um, what we're doing to celebrate the European Year of um, Cultural Heritage. Uh, we, ran, uh, we launched it um, a month ago in Brussels, and we ran a collection day. And we started um, collecting some very, very initial um, feedback. Um, so we started asking people, when you come along to a migration collection day, um, are you encouraged to learn more about migration? And we're finding that, roughly speaking, people are starting to say, yes, I am actually encouraged to learn more, which is great. That's what we really, really want people to do, share their story, but also take that on and do something with it. Um, and we've also asked them some slightly deeper questions. Um, there's more to it than just these two questions, but we can't show you everything. Um, which was about how aware the people coming were aware, how aware they were of their migration background. Um, because this is based on the premise that um, people sometimes aren't always aware of their migration background until they start sharing it and talking about it. Um, so we've been collecting this data. There's um, about 25 different um, uh, questions we ask people who come and uh, share their stories. And we'll be collecting them over um, a number of um, events throughout the year. We'll be reporting against this um, at the end of summer. So you'll be able to see some more results then. Um, so you can also read um, all of the other um, information I shared. It's all presented in case studies. It's available on impact.tools. Um, 
But how can then you uh, take this and use it to start a conversation in your organization? Because I think generally everybody thinks in impact is really interesting. Um, people believe that we can actually have an impact. You've shown me that you think that really digital cultural heritage is transformative, but how do we prove that? How do we start that conversation internally and with our own networks? That's a really difficult thing um, to do. Um, what we've done at Europeana is, um, so we've been working on trying to articulate this for a number of years. And last year, um, we used the research and the experiences we had um, over the summer to write up uh, this process under the guidance of some impact consultants um, into a playbook, into a methodology that you can then use to start having this conversation in your organizations. Um, this is best embodied in the impact toolkit because it's not just about having a methodology, it's about having all the other supporting material that you can um, access as well. So firstly you have the playbook which is um, it's like a cookbook. It's, it's a series of workshops and resources like canvases and sheets and guidance and documents that shows you how to start having this conversation. So say, for example, you work in an organization, you want to go back to your colleagues and say, you know what, I think we should start looking at the impact of our activities. How do we do that? You can go to the playbook and you, you can read um, what we think, how we think you, you can start this conversation. Um, we've got slide decks that help you talk through that conversation internally. And we've also got examples, and we've got case studies written up from members of our network, which you can access and hear about their experiences. And we're having some really lovely feedback from the few people that have been using it so far, that actually this is a really interesting conversation to start having in your organization. Um, so it's presented um, in quite a simple format. It's really there as a guide for you to um, use as you like and to adapt as you like. Everything is openly available. Um, and there's a number of tools like the change pathway, um, which is, is pretty much the theory of change that Michael was talking about earlier, that helps you articulate these changes, this impact. Because what I haven't talked about um, is the research that you do is also based on a, on a methodology. And the... Um, Playbook helps you develop your understanding, your, your method and your framework for asking these questions. So to be able to get to the 81% um, of um, uh, organizations actually increase their collaborations and partnerships with Europeana, you need to be able to understand that that's a change you want to be able to affect. Um, and you need to link that to some of the activities that you also um, have. And so the playbook helps you connect the things that you do with the things that you want to happen, the changes you want your users and your stakeholders to experience. We also have um, on the website, which is impact.tools, a series of resources. So there's case studies, there's canvases and downloads. Um, you'll also find here um, uh, links to our LinkedIn community. So if you want to join the conversation and see what other people are talking about, there's a LinkedIn group there. Um, you can share information on Twitter with sort of various hashtags. Um, and you'll find, um, uh, you'll find the playbook. You'll also find um, a video resource which explains what the playbook is about. If you want to share it with your colleagues, but don't feel quite like you, want, you can articulate it yourself. So on this website, it's really just a toolkit for helping you start this conversation. Oh, we have some tweets. Um, but in 2018, there is more to come. So this is really, what I've presented is really just where we got to at the end of 2017. Um, so to keep this conversation going in the sector, we are continuing to develop the work that we're doing. Um, first thing is, um, we're developing the playbook, because at the minute, it just helps you start the conversation. It helps you, you start to talk about impact and have the very beginnings of understanding what this means for you as an organization but it doesn't really talk you through the process of doing it. And that's what we're trying to do this year. We're doing that with the help of a task force. Um, David Haskier is on the task force, so he'll be helping contribute towards that. Um, so if you have issues with it, you can also talk to David. Um, but we're also developing five more case studies. The migration campaign is one of them. Um, we're building a knowledge bank of resources, so examples from around the sector. Um, and we're growing an impact community to help stem the conversation, share knowledge, um, in be between people, um, share best practices, examples, questions, um, you name it. So over the coming months, you should see even more um, discussion of impact um, coming out from the Europeana channels. 
Um, and really, impact.tools is the place you want to go if you want to find out any more information. Um, I'm around in the next uh, break, and I'd love to talk to any of you who have any questions or if you have some examples to share with me, because I'm always interested to hear examples of impact um, that come straight from cultural heritage institutions themselves. Thank you. Thank you, Julia, for many useful tips. Thank you. <laughs> Anybody wants to? comment or ask questions to Julia now? Yes, please. Hi, uh, thanks a lot. It was uh, very interesting and I think the, the, the topic of the digital user is uh, still under research to a large extent. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but you may not have included that kind of information, but I'm curious did you also get some information on who the typical user is? I mean, in terms of gender, education, profession, economy, where, where he or she lives, and so on and so on. Uh, we did, yeah. We asked some basic demographic information in all of our impact studies, mm. um, because we're also trying to see if we can detect any um, correlations. Mm. And the result was? Um, the result is that it's a mix. Right. Okay. <laughs> There's not really, I think um, uh, some of the research that I presented um, needs to go deeper. Mm. Um, some, some data is presented and all the data we have, all the data tables, the questions we ask, is all available openly. Um, some of it is based on say 20 respondents, it's sort of low, uh, low data, set, small data set, sorry. Um, we need to go deeper before we can really start drawing conclusions from some of this data. The, the, the data from the citizens, the individuals, was a, based on around about 200 responses. So it's a bit more significant. But when you think about the number of um, citizens living in Europe, it's not really representative. Mm. So we're not quite at that point yet. So I yeah. don't really feel comfortable in, I said, in drawing some of those things. Yeah, all right. Thank you. Okay. We have time for one more question. We can catch Julia during the break. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>